All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that pretty much sums me up. That's a, a good summary. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, so basically, uh, I, I was doing a bunch of travel and I think, uh, everyone was doing a lot of travel and, um, I've always wanted to do these, uh, conference talks and I, you know, they contacted me and I'm like, Hey, you know, this is uh, kind of a fun experiment. How do you do a conference talk online? Uh, how do you talk to an audience? So, uh, just like, uh, um, uh, has already been said, please tell us what you think about this. Uh, cause I would love to do more of this. I like uh, public speaking, but I don't particularly like conferences. So this would be a good option if we could do more of this. Okay. So now let me just organize my windows real quick. Cause I'm sure none of you want to watch me that big this whole time. Uh, for those of you wondering what I'm doing, I'm using OBS. Uh, if you've never used OBS, it's wonderful piece of software. And I was asked uh, to talk about kind of two things, uh, really quickly just talk about testing. So I'm going to talk about how I write tests um, on a few of my projects. And then also I'm going to talk about uh, Python compared to some of the newer languages. So I've been doing a lot of experimenting with Rust, uh, Go, Nim the most, and uh, my new project is all JavaScript. So I've been very deep into ES6. And so I'm going to go through kind of like um, what I see as sort of the landscape of the new languages, um, how they compare to Python, what advantages or disadvantages you might get from both of those, and sort of give a, as objective as possible a review of them. And hopefully this will be about 60 minutes. And actually, um, give me one second. I want to start a little timer. Okay, I'm using uh, Chrome to show the PDF, so I have to scroll the PDF because Chrome is lame. <laughs> so, and also it looks like I might cover some of my text with my head. Maybe I will just get rid of my head. We'll see how this goes. Okay, so first off, uh, I just want to say thanks for inviting me. Um, as they said, I travel a whole lot, and I really like traveling, so... Uh, I've always wanted to travel uh, through um, as much of the world as I can. Uh, recently, I did uh, Hawaii, Thailand, uh, Georgia. I uh, really like Tbilisi. Um, I've been through a lot of uh, other parts of Europe. Uh, I've never been to Bulgaria. I would love to visit Bulgaria. I hear it's, uh, it's uh, really nice. I was reading some articles about uh, a lot of the big things that have been happening there. And... Um, so this is a really unique opportunity for me because uh, I don't get to speak online much or in person, in public very much anymore. And so, you know, it's kind of nice to make a connection and uh, potentially try to set something up in the future. And uh, really quick, we're going to cover asking questions. Uh, so I think the easiest way with a webinar is drop your question in the chat and then someone from the Stripes team uh, will collect up the questions and then maybe they'll ask us, you know, like as many as we can, uh, maybe 30 minutes or 15 minutes of questions. And uh, feel free to ask uh, anything you want to. You don't have to ask just about this presentation. You can ask about uh, painting, building guitars, whatever you want. Uh, but I'll probably focus on questions related to this first, since that's what people came for. All right, and the agenda. So I'm going to cover testing, how I do testing, really quick. I think it's... Um, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's, I do testing very different because I'm uh, an individual and I work on everything all by myself. So that sort of changes how I do testing, but I do think it's a, it's a valid strategy in general. And then I'm going to get into Python versus Nim, Go, ES6, I threw in. I'll talk about why. It's JavaScript, but it's kind of not, and Rust. And I want everyone to understand when I say versus, uh, I really hate the, idea within technology that there's an us versus them. So I'm much more practical. You'll see, I'm like, use Python. Like if you're doing data science, use Python. If uh, you want to try these other languages, I'm going to give you some reasons to try it and uh, do experiments. Don't go all out. Um, try little bits if you want to try a language. Okay, so automated testing. I don't like to use words like unit testing or Inter integration testing. I say automated because that just covers everything in my situation. All right, so I'm a small business owner, right? I sell all my books by myself. 
I write all the code by myself. I have zero funding. It's all from sales. And the number one thing I have to deal with is reducing costs. I think that's the, the most significant thing about being a business owner on your own. Like I read an article real recently about uh, a few fellows who were running some, uh, just say, let me get a drink of water. Um, I read an article uh, where there was a couple of people who did a small startup, and in two hours, they spent $72,000 on an accidental experiment. <laughs> they were using a Google Cloud run. $72,000 in two hours would just, uh, that would bankrupt me. Like if I didn't catch that soon enough, right? So as a small business owner, I have to keep costs really low. And so that sort of is like a big theme throughout this whole presentation to kind of take in is I'm very focused on reducing costs. And I think a lot of the industry doesn't focus on cost reduction enough because um, they just spend money on technology and stuff. And they don't really think like, you know, how can we reduce the cost? Because if you have revenue coming in and reduce your costs, that's your profits. And that's really what's more important than revenue. All right, so my strategy is pretty straightforward. What I do, and this is, it's revolutionary because, not revolutionary, it's different because what most other people do is they kind of test from the back to the front. So they'll test, um, you know, data structures, back ends, and then slowly they make it to the front end. And what I do is I go from the front end. And when I do the UI, I do the front end. What I'm trying to do is get the most for my efforts, like the most code that I write to get the most testing and the most reliability. And what I found is, if I start with the user interface, something like a login screen with just a couple of buttons and a couple of forms seems to hit a ton of code. Whereas if I start with the back end, I have to very micro laser hit every line of code. So it's kind of like a blunt force hammer in a way. The next thing I try to do is uh, or randomize my inputs. Now, I just use a library called uh, Faker, and that seems to do a good job of giving me semi-random inputs. I don't do, like, cryptographically random, but it picks passwords with random stuff in it. It picks usernames that are random, and that helps you catch a lot of problems. And then I remove code, so I'll talk about that in a second, and I try to induce errors. Okay, so what does this all mean? So... I start with the UI first using fake user inputs. I make a fake user, and uh, that seems to work really well. And my big thing with this is I'm pretending to be a user. So this does two things for me. If my test is super hard to write, there's usually a really good chance that the page is also hard to use. Um, so it's kind of a small usability test. Now, sometimes the test is just hard to write because it's very interactive. But sometimes it's like, no, nah, the form fields are really in a strange order, or they have strange names, you know, or they're just, there's too many. Uh, the other thing it does is, like I said before, it hits a ton of the application. So filling out just like one user settings form will hit the whole stack from all kinds of angles. And then if you use random inputs, it tends to hit things you didn't expect. So that's it. Usually what I use for that is a project called Puppeteer. Um, and we'll talk about why uh, that's sort of the, kind of the better option. They're all kind of bad, but it's, it's a good option. The next thing is random input. And so I use a project called Faker. And Faker does a pretty good job of giving you random inputs that aren't totally random, if you know what I mean. So it's not garbage. Uh, but it's unexpected things like passwords that are too short, um, things that are too long, uh, strange characters you might not type, things like that. So that helps a lot. That makes things very reliable. Um, and then sometimes I'll throw in some actual garbage just to make sure my inputs are caught. So this helps me a lot. It does things like, you know, I had a password limit of six, and then Faker was entering in five uh, character passwords, and I wasn't catching it. So little things like that. Now, this is the 
kind of controversial one, I think, because programmers like writing code and they like keeping their code. <laughs> so uh, I'm working on myself, I'm all this on my own. So if I have code floating around that I don't use, I got to remove it. You know, I just have to take it out. So what I do is if after I'm done, I've tested everything, I go and I look at some code coverage if I can. And I see like, okay, I'm not hitting this code with the user interface. What does it do? Why do I have it here? And if I have no reason for it to be there, I, and I think nobody's going to use this, I just delete it. The safest code and the most reliable code is no code. Just delete the code. You don't have to worry about it. Now, I can add it later. I have Git. So it's not like I lost it. If I'm like, oh, that's why I need it, then I add it back. So again, this is related to costs. Uh, code is a cost. Having a lot of code is a cost. It's hard to change. It's hard to manage. So reducing it helps. And the final thing I do is I induce error states. And so um, there's two kinds of errors I'll try to do. Uh, one is ones that I could do as a bad user. So trying to go to web pages that shouldn't be allowed to go to and um, trying to input bad input, things like that. And then the other one I'll do is I'll use a mock. So a mock is where you can like hijack a function and have it do something different. And I'll hijack a function and make it throw an exception. And then when I do that, I throw that exception. Um, then I see how the system handles it. And that seems to cover the code you can't reach with the front end, but that you have to keep around. Usually error code is what you can't get to at the front end. Because if you did your UI right, people really shouldn't be inducing errors. <clears throat> All right, so now why does this work? The main thing that it does is it makes it so that um, I'm getting the most value for my time. I'm focusing on making sure that the front end works, that it looks great and works well for the person paying me money, for the person buying my book, so they don't leave and so that they keep using it. That's the main reason why it works. The other reason why it works is it tends to force me to make my user interfaces simpler. Um, it makes it so that my tests really kind of confirm that the whole application is actually working. And then it sort of uh, covers so much of the, of the testing that really I'm only left with a, a few things that I have to test on the back end um, just to make sure that they work. Like sometimes I'll write model tests or I'll write tests for um, sending emails and queues and things like that, which is kind of painful and slow to do through the front end. Um, now I was gonna show you a sample test I use, uh, but um, basically, let me see if I can get to it. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm kind of writing the next application all in the open. I would say this is kind of version one. It's actually um, not the best version I want to do. And these are the kind of tests that you have. And logins are typically, uh, and you can see, like, I don't have a lot of tests. It's a fairly involved web application. It has, like, web torrent videos and courses and all sorts of stuff. And I only have those tests. It does a pretty okay job. And then this is an example of the kind of test. And so what you can see, it's, I mean, it's not revolutionary. Uh, you know, I mean, JavaScript is kind of annoying with its await, but I think if you use uh, Selenium WebDriver, same stuff in Python, it's pretty similar. I don't think any web testing frameworks are all that good, to be honest. And so this is kind of what I'm doing. Um, a lot of what you want to do, there's, you can use data tags. And if anyone's interested in this, I can actually um, uh, show it some offline or whatever. But uh, I use a data test ID. And then I can actually access it right away with, um, without using like classes or class IDs or anything like that. I have a test ID on the CSS, and, and that makes it easy. And that's it. Now, this alone, this one test here, um, tests all kinds of things about live streams. Does the video open up? Does it actually do anything? Here's login. This test here does login. And all of these tests, I think, hit about 
just the UI test that I have here hit like maybe 85 or 90% of the app code. So for very small amounts of test code, I get a lot of value. Now, I was going to do, hey, here's that test, <laughs> you know, like I have this test. And I was going to say, oh, look, and now here it is in NIM, and here it is in Go, and here it is in Rust. Isn't that awesome? And then, um, no, actually, a lot of these languages, even Python, um, they're nothing compared to JavaScript because I'm testing browsers. So the browser is in JavaScript. So it's just, it's a win. You can't beat JavaScript running the browser, right? And so I decided, okay, I'm not going to do that. It, the presentation is going to be too long. So the, the thing to get out of the testing is that my strategy and my theme and my attitude about selecting languages, selecting technology is cost. As you saw in that test and how I do my tests, um, I keep it small. I keep it like how much power do I get out of my own efforts? And so I'm going to do a review of the Python versus these other languages with that, that in mind. I've written plenty of apps in Python. Um, I've written a few things in NIM, a tiny bit of stuff in Go, a little bit of Rust, and a lot in ES6. Um, I'm also including ES6 in new languages, even though JavaScript is ancient. Uh, I forget, does it predate Python? I think it's older than Python, or about the same age. But the reason why ES6, I think, is a new language is it's a very different syntax. It's much more like Rust and Go, and even NIM in a way. And it's interesting because it's layered on top of all the old versions of JavaScript. So you can mix and match the syntax. It's pretty amazing stuff. It's pretty much what we wanted with Python 2 versus Python 3. So I'm going to say ES6, not JavaScript. I'm going to say ES6, the new language. How does it compare to Python? Now, I also throw in, there's a language called Zig and Crystal. If you're a Ruby fan, you like Ruby, check out Crystal. Crystal's pretty snazzy. I like it. It's just they're very small and very young, and I felt it'd be very unfair to compare these two tiny little projects with a small team to Go, which is backed by a trillion-dollar company, and Rust, which is backed by a half-a-billion-dollar company, and ES6, which is backed by, I guess, what, four trillion-dollar companies, like all the browser manufacturers, you know? So comparing tiny little Zig and Crystal to those three is just not good. Yeah, I think it's just, um, I just removed them because it's unfair. Okay, so how am I going to evaluate them? Oh, yes, but first, a small warning. Okay, so don't take this review as like an us versus them. Like, I think we should destroy Python. I am very done with that sort of... Uh, there's, there's a winner. I want no programming language to be the winner. I don't want any language to beat another language. I want you to use the tool that works. So I'm evaluating this compared to Python as just does it work? How does it work? What don't I like about Python? What don't I like about these languages? And I'm not saying ditch all your Python and go all out NIM. Never, ever do I say that. I'm very practical. And please, please, whatever you do, don't get on your Twitter yelling at me because you think I, I like, uh, ruined your life with Python or something. Uh, that does happen, by the way. Uh, so don't take this personally. Okay. So what's our evaluation criteria? Okay, so I'm going to do something called code aesthetics. And the idea with code aesthetics is, it does it look gross? I guess that's the best way to put it. Code aesthetics is really hard to pin down. Everyone has their own flavor, their own idea. It's like art, you know? Uh, some people like paintings about trees, and some people like paintings of nude humans. You know, it's just totally different. So I'm just show you kind of like what the languages generally look like. So we can sort of establish, like, what they're not doing anything original is the best way to put it. Then learnability and usability. If you sit down to use this language, are you going to run into problems because you like IDE? Are you going to have to have problems with documentation? Are you going to have to interact with a community that's kind of hostile? Right? How do those compare with Python and, you know, like how hard is it to learn this stuff? Then I'm going to get into build versus use versus buy. 
and I was going to remove capabilities. Um, uh, so remove capabilities off this list. I guess it didn't render that part. Uh, but the general idea with build versus buy is if you sit down to do a web application, do you have to write your own bcrypt library? Or can you go find something? Or can you buy something? Can you just like buy a service and be done with it? And then finally, I'm going to get into cost and risk reduction. Again, the theme of this. How much does this cost? Like on a personal level and also on an organizational level. What are the two or three big things that I see these languages potentially increasing or reducing your costs? Uh, not included in this is just, uh, are they fun? And honestly, I think all these languages are very fun. If you're just doing this as a hobby and you just want to try something new, try them all. They're great. They're very fun. Okay, so code aesthetics. Uh, has everyone heard of Rosetta Code? Let me just see if I can. I think I had the window up already. Yes. Okay, so Rosetta Code, yeah, here we go. Uh, Rosetta Code is great because what they do is they pick a problem. This is how do you format a date? And then a bunch of people sit down who like their languages and they try to write the best example of how to format a date in that language. And it's just a ton of languages. I'm just, just format a date. You know, so and there's some languages in here I had no idea existed. Oh, I remember Rex. Anyone ever do? Um, oh man, I'm old. <laughs> Rex was with uh, OS2 decades ago. Uh, so the idea is, I can show you kind of the aesthetic difference with some very simple examples, and they have some complex examples too. Um, so let's just look for Python. Let me see. Yeah, here we go. Here's Python. All right, nothing fancy, right? You get a date, the ISO format it, and then format it that way. Really simple, no problems. Okay, now let's go look up NIM, because NIM is kind of like Python. It's very close and pretty simple. Um, time, you import some times, you get a function called now, and then you can format it with two formatting styles. Yeah, nothing. Now, what's the importance of aesthetics? Let's look at NIM and this other language called object, <laughs> right? Okay, if I had to write this, I would, I would really just not be happy. <laughs> this is so many words. So you look at NIM. This is the aesthetics. There's people who like this. They like these, this, this wordy, like you, you have to use an IDE to write this. This is just insane. It's like the person who did this hates any string larger than two characters, right? So this is kind of what I'm talking about. Aesthetically, Python and NIM are really similar. You don't type a lot to make it do anything. And if you were using this language object, you would have to type just so much. Print, get the year, print, print. Ugh, it's just so wordy and so verbose. Right, so that's what we mean by aesthetics. If you had to sit down and write NIM code, you'd be kind of okay with it. It's different, but it's not like radically different. Okay, let's go look at uh, Go. And Go is like the worst word to look for in a list because it's everywhere. It's also, I, I find it really ironic that a search engine company made the worst language to search for. There we go, Go. Okay, again. Hey, nothing revolutionary. You import some stuff. I'd say it's maybe a little bit wordy, but not bad. It's not like that object language, right? That's crazy. Okay, let's try one more. Uh, let's do JavaScript. And let me just do it this way. And let's do Rust. If there is a Rust. Oh, there is no Rust. Interesting. Oh, there it is. Okay, again, nothing revolutionary. And I think that's the theme that I see with these, with these uh, newer languages. Nobody wants to be the next Haskell, right? Haskell was weird. It was being different. In a lot of ways, it was being different for no reason. 
And so that made it difficult to pick up. Whereas, you know, JavaScript, I have no idea what this example is. That is crazy. <laughs> I don't think the person has to do this. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is how you've solved this particular problem in JavaScript. I, I hadn't actually looked at this seriously. Um, so, but there's nothing revolutionary in that, right? It's kind of, eh, whatever, you know, there's nothing weird in this. I might go, okay, well, what are these exclamation points for? That's about it. And if you go through Rosetta code, I won't go through all the examples. Um, draw a circle is a really good one. Because they'd have to draw, um, well, their search is kind of bad. Anyways, a draw a circle is a really good one because um, if you look at that, some of the languages don't have a built-in graphics system, and some do. So let, that shows you, like, if you like graphics, which one is good. And you can go through all the examples that you want. But my general idea with code aesthetics is, you know, not a lot has, is revolutionary between them. You know, Nim and Python they have the Pythonic in, indentation syntax. And then with uh, the other ones, it's kind of more of a C syntax because they're trying to compete with C. So, I mean, yeah, th there's nothing fancy or crazy about it. I think if, you know, you have a, a real pain point with curly brackets, then, yeah, you're not going to like those. But, I don't know, for me, that's kind of arbitrary. Okay, now, so learnability and usability. If you were to sit down and try to learn this today, what kind of documentation are you going to have? Is there IDE support? What kind of help would you get from the community? And how good are the errors? Okay, and I have one slide for this because most of the languages are all the same on this. So documentation. All of the languages have good books. They have good online documentation. NIMS online documentation is great. Python's online do documentation is great. Goes. All the languages have good online docs. Um, I find JavaScript is actually kind of the worst, uh, especially ES6. There's no like overall, here's all of the ES6 features and how to use them. It's kind of confusing to try to use some new stuff. Uh, IDE support. All of the languages have IDE support to varying degrees. So JavaScript and Go, those are top professional languages. You find that in Visual Studio Code, it gets used a lot. Um, NIM, Rust, and uh, uh, well, Python obviously has great IDE support, but NIM and Rust, their IDE support is typically more through um, something called ALE. So I have, you know, completion and all the IDE features in my Vim because I use ALE, and it basically runs a little server in the background and passes your syntax to this thing, and it gives you whatever that language thinks about it. So they're all varying degrees of IDE support. I'm not a big IDE fan, but if you are, um, and that's like your big thing, you're going to want to do probably Python, NIM, and JavaScript. Or not NIM, uh, Go and JavaScript. Uh, community help. Uh, so all of them have decent-sized communities. Obviously, Python has a big community. Go has a big community. Rust has got a big one. JavaScript's got the biggest. Uh, JavaScript, there's kind of no central place you can go, um, which is interesting. Uh, there's a little communities all over, but there's no, like, this is the JavaScript channel. But with Go and Rust, Nim, those all have it. Uh, Python's kind of similar to JavaScript. There's no like central place, really. I would say something to add to community help is, um, do they kind of ban you for no reason? And I bring this up because um, Go recently banned some guy because he, um, he said the word half-assed. So half-assed just means you didn't do a good job. It's like mediocre. But because it had the word ass in the middle, and that's against the Go rules, they banned him from the whole community. So I would rank Go pretty low just for that. But, you know, people have to be able to ask questions and express themselves if they want to get help. And I find that kind of abusive. So um, I would also say, uh, we'll get into it, but watch out for Rust as well. Uh, and Python to a degree. Okay, and now error quality. Uh, universally, all programming languages have terrible error quality. Um, what this means is like you get an error message and you know how to fix it. I think the number one thing everyone learns in programming is not programming language syntax, but how to read error messages so you know what to fix. And every language sucks. 
Like I, I've used all these and uh, yeah, they're awful. They're just terrible. Um, there's also a correlation. The more uh, type safety a language has, the worse the error messages. <laughs> so if you've ever used like C++ or Haskell or um, uh, you know, even Rust or Nim, Nim's error messages are kind of okay. But yeah, if you get a lot of types and there's a big type theory thing involved, terrible error messages. Okay, so again, I would say on the learnability and usability levels, these are all about the same, right? Minor degrees between them. There's, it's sort of a wash, right? Other than, you know, the weird sort of banning within Go. Um, and the IDE support is kind of missing in NIM and Rust. Overall, though, they're good. The NIM documentation is great. All of them have great documentation. Okay, now we're going to get into build versus using something versus buying something. And with this one, I'm going to kind of go into more detail. And the reason why is the other ones, the languages are about the same for aesthetics, or I'm just not going to convince you the aesthetics matter, don't matter. Um, for learnability and documentation, they're all about the same. Like, you know, the same general quality you get from most languages that are of that level. But the build used by, now they get a little more specific and different. So let's talk about what is available. Like, let's say you're going to sit down to build a game or a data science or a web, a web service or something like that. What is available? And, and this is in no particular order. I think I just copy and pasted the exact same list over and over again. So it's not a ranking. All right, so Python. Um, Python, clearly, there's a lot available. And it's just a lot of what's available is kind of old. I would say because these languages are new, what they offer is newer. But other than that, there's a lot available, right? Python has a lot of stuff. And it really depends on your domain, though. Uh, I think if you were trying to do a game, eh, it's, it's OK. NIM, NIM seems to be very targeted at games. Like they have native building for Nintendo Switch. It's kind of the only language I've seen do that. Uh, Go, yeah, you know, like Go's got some game stuff, but it's not their big thing. Their, their thing is kind of what Google does, which is web services. And Rust, uh, Rust seems to be very big on operating systems. So it seems like, you know, everyone else writes a blog, a blog for their first app, and Rust people write an operating system for their first app. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. If you like operating systems, Rust is probably your thing. But the gold crown easily is ES6. ES6 is, I mean, just amazing the amount of stuff that's available. It's a varying quality, but everything you want to do is there. It's, uh, it's just amazing what you can do with it. Now, I will add a small thing about NIM. NIM's unique feature is that it doesn't compile necessarily to machine code. It compiles to an intermediate language. So it'll compile to C, Objective-C, C++, and JavaScript. And then it has its own built-in NIM script. And what makes that interesting is NIM doesn't have a lot available, but it can hook into all of the C++ that's available, all of the C that's available, and all the JavaScript that's available. So it kind of gives it a force multiplier. It's, you know, there's not a lot in NIM itself, but what is there seems to be decent quality, uh, seems to be a small amount of code, does very lot, but I think mostly people will use it to hook other things together. It's, it's like an excellent glue language in that way. Okay, what's the general quality between them? Um, after using Python for many years, originally Python's quality was pretty high, and I think over the years, Python has sort of stagnated. I don't think the quality is there anymore when you compare it to the other languages that are out there. Um, so for example, Go, uh, all the stuff that I see coming out of Go seems to be very high quality. And I think that's because, I mean, let's be honest, Go has a trillion dollar company behind it. Of course it's gonna have crazy good quality. Like it's tough to compete with Google. Like <laughs> it's sort of unfair, right? Uh, NIM, I find the quality coming out of NIM is pretty high. Like it's a, it seems to be a good language. And I think a lot of that quality and the quality that you see, say, with NIM, Go, and Rust, I think a lot of that is because of the type safety, the built-in syntactic language helping you make better, quote, better code. Um, I'd also say those three languages give you type safety, 
without being mean about it, without uh, w with helping you with it. Whereas other type safe languages in the past uh, seem to sort of like want to beat you over the head with types and not help you. So in that regard, I think Python is really kind of the lowest when it comes to quality, except with ES6. So JavaScript, there's so much stuff that um, it's a range of quality. So you can, you know, there's like one project. You, let's say you want to find a login system passport is like the de facto standard, but there's a ton of other things and they're all terrible compared to passport. So or ES6, I would say, is, um, is very much a power distribution of quality where like the stuff that is good is very good. And then there's a lot of trash. So that's my general view of quality of what's out there. I would just generally say Python's, the stuff available in Python is old. And I'll also say probably one of the reasons why Python's stuff is old is that the Python 2.3 uh, changeover sort of just made projects die and they don't get updated anymore. It was like, why would you bother? You just go use one of the other languages. All right, can you build? So in this regard, clearly, every language you could build whatever you want. Um, and this is, uh, it depends. Each language is going to be good at something. Like Python is really good at the data science stuff for now. Um, incidentally, you can do almost all, actually, all of the data science that you do in Python uh, in JavaScript. They, uh, Facebook is very big on making sure that happens. Um, so, but for other things like a desktop app, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can do PyQt. Um, it's just not very great uh, when you compare it to, say, ES6. So ES6, you have Electron. You have like three or four systems for doing desktop apps. Um, you can do uh, tons of mobile apps, web apps, games. I mean, just the stuff you can make with JavaScript is amazing. Um, and distribute it easily to everybody on a web page. It's just amazing what you can do with JavaScript. Um, NIM. You can build most everything you want, but I think NIM's power in this is it can hook into the, all the other stuff that uh, is already written. And that's not all roses. Trust me, there's still some work there. But it's not as bad as, say, um, having to write it in Rust. Um, so Go, Go has a lot if you're doing web services. They do have some GUI stuff. Uh, they have some graphics. It seems graphics are pretty straightforward in Go. Uh, but it's not really their focus. So again, right tool for the job, right? Like if I was doing data science, I would do Python. Right? I would just start with Python, and then if I had to, I'd optimize it with something else. Uh, but if I was doing a, a desktop app, JavaScript. I would either do it as a web app. I would use something like Svelte, which is just fantastic. Svelte is just so good. Um, let me just, so that everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say Svelte, uh, svelte.dev. Really good user interface design. If you're working on user interface, you prototyping it with Svelte is very easy. Um, yeah, I wouldn't do a, a GUI in Python, really, like a serious one. If I was doing something trash, you could just use, you know, the whatever, the PyTK thing. Uh, but if I wanted to do a real phone app, a real app that was cross-platform, a real desktop app, I mean, come on. We've got billion and trillion dollar companies use JavaScript and something like Electron to do that. So right tool for the job, they can all do what you want. I would say the other aspect of can you build is if you build something, how receptive is the community to it? So if you're just building for yourself, who cares? But if you want to release it, you want to get some feedback, then, or you want to have, like, use it as sort of a marketing thing, then it's important to pick the community that's going to be most receptive. And what I find is Nim and Go and JavaScript sort of don't care what you make. They're just sort of like, whatever, you know, everybody should make stuff. I find Rust is kind of like that, but they had this one incident where um, the Actix web framework, uh, the person working on that, I think he had the word unsafe in a lot of places. And unsafe is how you tag something as it's like C, like there's no memory safety elements. And he was doing that for speed. And for some reason, the community just ruined him. Like they went after him on this one uh, bug on, on GitHub. I think it was like a few hundred people just destroyed him. It was brutal. And I just find, like, if you're going to build something and release it, and the community response is that kind of an attack, it's too risky, right? Uh, but if you never release it, who cares? 
And then I find uh, Python, the community in general, has this sort of like weird reaction to people making new stuff. I think it's always been that way. It's very weird. Uh, in my mind, making stuff, the artistic expression of these things is sort of the point. And, you know, the Python community has, you know, they make fun of JavaScript, like, ah, ha, ha, they all go running after new things. But, you know, JavaScript isn't preventing anybody from making it. It's encouraging it. And then Python is not encouraging it. And I think that's, you know, significant. It sort of limits people's creativity. Now, the other part of that, and uh, I'll give another drink real quick. Uh, how hard is it to distribute the thing you write? And, uh, you know, all of them have decent package management. This is all about package management and how do you get it to the people. Uh, let's just be honest. Python's package management works, but it is definitely not the best. I mean, I'm not, probably not the only person who hates pip. I hope I'm not the only person who hates easy install and pip. Um, but, yeah, Python's whole pip virtual env um, easy install thing is just, it's just terrible. And it's never going to go away. Uh, but you can distribute it, yes. You can put your stuff on PyPy. You're good. You can give it to people. Um, you can make packages. You can compile down. It's fine. Uh, NIM goes more with a, um, there's like a centralized registry where you can announce things, but then things are pulled from GitHub. So unlike PyPy where they want you to upload the software to them and they control it, NIM, they more reference things. And I think that's the trend. You see that with Go. You see that with Rust. Um, you see that with uh, ES6, too. And then you have Go, uh, Nim, Go, and I think Rust. I forget. You mostly just install from GitHub. So you just say, install that URL. And that's that gives you freedom, right? You can tell people, give them private access to a GitHub repo and give them access to a professional piece of software. You don't have to go through PIP or set up your own PIP or anything like that. And then ES6, uh, they, you know, everyone has to go through NPM. That seems to be the de facto. There are multiple package managers. NPM's kind of like, eh, it's mediocre, you know, but there's Yarn. There's other alternatives that seem to work pretty well. And um, it's nice because people write alternatives and nobody attacks them for it. Whereas I've seen in Python when people might write alternatives uh, to say easy install, it's a very long haul because it's competing with something that a python old guard wrote and it's difficult to um stop that now let me just check presentation how am i doing all right great okay so can you distribute all the languages you can distribute but i would say out of the three python's probably the worst the best would have to be ES6 easily because you can make a web page. Nothing beats a web page, right? You can make whole games that run in just the browser. It's amazing. Desktop apps. Distribution is very easy in ES6. Um, Nim, Go, and Rust are all about the same. They all use the same sort of pattern of maybe there's a central registry to announce stuff, but mostly it's installed from Git. And then can you buy it? Let's say you don't want to write your authentication layer. Okay, so Python, totally. Yeah, you can buy whatever you want. Go, you can probably buy. ES6, definitely you can buy, right? You can find a vendor for all three of those, no problem. Basically, it's going to be like an enterprise vendor in a lot of those instances. Um, NIM, not really. They're small. And I, I have to say, all of these languages except NIM have huge monetary backing. Like, they've got tons of money. Python's got a huge organization behind it. Go has a trillion dollar company. Rust has a bunch of companies behind it. ES6 has a massive amount of money behind it just because of the browser. So NIM is actually successfully competing with those, I would say, in features and capability with very, le very little money. And that alone, remember, my entire idea is reduce the costs. That alone is a really good indicator that NIM reduces your costs because they are actually running on very little money. But we'll get into how that can also be a risk. Okay, so now I'm going to rank it. But this is a first ranking because there's kind of a clear ranking in my mind if build, use, buy is a big issue for you. 
Uh, number one is obviously JavaScript. I think JavaScript, there hasn't been anything I have not found. Like, I'm pretty much, I go to JavaScript, I find a thing, ooh, some guy wrote it. And then if it's junk, I, may, I can basically write a quick version that is similar in my own and fix it. Okay. Now, Nim, I would say is number two only because it can compile down to using C, C++, JavaScript, or Objective-C. So it has access to all that stuff. But I would also say NIM could also be number five because there's not a lot written in NIM itself, right? So it depends on what your, what your idea of use versus build is. I place Python in number three because there's a lot of stuff, but it's kind of old stuff. And you don't see a lot of updating. The culture is very much about keeping things all the same and not sort of advancing things further and so on. So uh, that's why I put it number three. Uh, Go, there's a lot, but it's, it seems to be very focused on web frameworks, uh, services, things like that. So it, that's pretty low. And then Rust is just kind of newer. If you want an operating system, Rust is, is totally it. It's the only one. It's the king of the operating systems. Uh, but as far as like a bunch of stuff available for it, not really. I think once it's used for something like Servo, like Servo is really out, then this will this will probably explode because maybe they can have a lot of the things that helped Rust make Servo, like the GUI, come out and boost Rust and make it easier to make desktop apps and things like that. Okay, so now let's get into cost reduction. And uh, let me get another drink real quick. Okay, so cost reduction is, I think, one of uh, the sort of hidden dangers in a lot of technology. And it's going to come from all kinds of things, you know, how much you have to spend on programmers making tragic mistakes. Uh, if anyone saw recently, the Uber, uh, the person who ran a huge uh, Swift upgrade project, they were doing their uh, iPhone app and they did everything in Swift. And uh, it turned out to be just a total disaster because Swift was just way too new. And um, it's things like that. Like, that's your cost. It's also very hard to pin down. So I'm going to cover just a couple little things to consider. If you're thinking about using any of these languages, competing with Python on a personal level, who cares? Nobody cares about cost. Nobody cares how fast it is. Make what you want. Express yourself. But if you think about doing this in my context, I'm a small business person. I'm trying to make something. I don't want to spend a lot of money in a lot of time um, for no reason, right? Or you're running a business of any kind. All right, so I would say the number one cost is future-proofness. Like how much of risk is there that you pick this language and in the future, you're going to hit some huge cost. And honestly, we have to start with Python because the Python 2.3 rewrite, I have to say is probably one of the biggest cost drivers in program I've ever seen. Um, just the fact that the language just forced everyone to rewrite their code is definitely a massive cost and a huge risk if you want a language to be future-proof. And also keep in mind, there's nothing from the Python project that says they will never do it again. There's no promise that they will never, ever force you to rewrite all of your code again. And to me, that's a huge risk. I say if you have a bunch of Python 3 code, a bunch of Python 2 code, and you don't ever want that to happen again, you got to start looking for something new. And for that, that's honestly the number one danger with Python is that they've demonstrated they just don't care. Uh, NIM, it's future-proof. They seem to deprecate things pretty gently, but it's a small project. You never know. It could just die, and the project has to go into maintenance mode, and that's it. So that's the big thing with it. If you're using it for personal fun, great. You know, If you're planning on using it for something big, you might want to consider that you have to pump some money into it in order to keep it around. Because it is competing with some huge, huge languages. And that's a risk. Uh, Go. I mean, it's Google. Come on, Google. They, they kill stuff off like it's nothing. Uh, oh, everyone used Dart. No, forget about Dart. Uh, everyone used Google Reader. Forget about Google Reader. 
Uh, I don't think they'll kill Go. I think Go is very independent. They use Go. It's very popular. There's a lot of other companies involved in Go. But Google has also demonstrated that they kind of don't care about um, maintaining the community. Their module system was developed by one person at Google and didn't care what anyone else created. They frequently, like I said, they ban people. They just sort of like, they're Google, you know? That's, that's what they do. They just destroy stuff. So keep that in mind. Um, Rust. Rust is interesting because it was backed by a large company, Mozilla, but now it's sort of on its own. So I'm not sure where their status is as far as reliability. I'd have to say it's, it's more like NIM. I'd say it's a stiff competitor. They've got some really great features. Um, as far as operating systems and embedded work, I think if you're doing embedded, Rust is something to definitely investigate. Um, and NIM has some nice embedded features as well, but Rust is, I'd say, is if you're looking to replace C with NIM, with something more reliable and embedded, Rust might be your thing to check out. But as far as future proof, I don't know. They don't really have a spec. Uh, they don't have really much of a, a like a, a management board you can join. It's not like JavaScript or Go or Python where you can actually shape the language. Uh, so that's something to look out for. They might just decide, oh, you have to do it this way, or that syntax is gone. You know, and you have another Python 2.3 situation. But I would say the gold standard for how to make your language future-proof is definitely ES6. Um, they basically did what the Python people said was impossible. Python, claim, uh, Python project claimed that you couldn't write Python 3 code to coexist with Python 2 code. But I can write ES6 syntax, ES6 code, and freely mix it with all the old styles of JavaScript code even though they're pretty much two totally different languages. Um, semantically, there's differences. Um, everything about it is just very different. And they, it's layered on top. And then they have tools to help you do migration and to recompile it for older browsers. But the only thing I've ran into with ES6 is that um, the Node project is holding back modules. Like import statements are still kind of broken. But other than that, it's... It's a, the gold standard for how to future-proof your language to make sure that nobody is left behind and they can keep using the new features without throwing out all of their old stuff. And I think the only reason they have that is because of projects like Babel, but also because they have to. They're forced to support old browsers. So they had to go through and do that. So that's, I think, a big cost there. Is it future-proof? Are you going to basically have to spend like a ton of money on programmers to migrate your code over uh, if the project dies or one day, you know, they announced Python 4. It's totally different. We put parentheses around assert this time. So rewrite all your code. You know, nobody wants that. Okay, compute costs. This is a touchy, this is a touchy thing. It's tough to sort of tell people, hey, you know, you got to take this seriously. Let me just pull it up. Yeah, so Tech Empower um, does this thing called Framework Benchmarks. And they're, they're very legit, right? They're very, very legit. I, I looked at it. It's, you know, every benchmark has flaws. But it's not, it's not like a terrible flaw. And I think the thing to look at, think of this in terms of cloud hosting. Let's say you are hosting a Django app, and it takes you 100 EC2 instances to run that thing. How much money would you save switching to something else? Like, you'd have to pay a programmer to switch to it, but maybe, maybe that's just a, a, a small cost compared to the overall long-term cost of not running as many EC2 instances. So Tech Empower gives you sort of a clue. So they run rounds and then everyone tries to update it. And I'll tell you the secret to why a lot of these languages are kind of really killing it, because it's a, it's a very fancy trick I just found out. But you look at something like, I think this is C++. This is Rust. Um, there's some Go, and uh, there's some JavaScript. PHP, right? OK, so here. This is a request per second. 678,000 requests per second. All right, so now we're going to go find Django. All right, found Django. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, right? I mean, that's ridiculously bad. That is terrible. And if you look, like, you know, none of these are very good. Like, you go through here, you know, Weppy, Pi 3, Pi 2, Active Web, Pyramid. Like, the, the Ruby and the Python web frameworks are down at the bottom. The very, very bottom. Right? Here, this is a Java one. I think it just failed. I don't think, yeah, I think it just had errors. So, okay. Oh, Flask. Flask is terrible for performance, right? Okay, so people always say, you know, performance doesn't matter, developer happiness matters. But it does matter when you start to get to scale. Again, if you're just doing it on your personal level, then who cares? Like you get you handle one request a second, like you care if it's ten thousand, right? But when you're talking cost, like if you have to run turbo gears, and it costs, it takes you 20 EC2 instances, you're blowing like maybe 20 grand a month running it, and all you gotta do is rewrite some part of it in Dra Dragon Core, right? Let's say it's a, a JavaScript API. That's insane, you could totally run this on like a $5 VPS and get the same performance. It's pretty nuts. Or Actix Core, right? That's some money that is actually worth investigating if this is a cost for you for me it is a cost i currently have to run a few big servers because i use django and just switching to javascript right like if, even if you look at javascript it's down in the middle here right so just switching to javascript the php is faster like you look there's some php things here that are you know 10 15 times faster sometimes so that cost does start to be something you have to look at. Like it's, if it's 10,000 requests per second versus 15,000, who cares? When it's 10,000 requests per second versus 678,000 requests per second, that is a massive cost reduction. That's like two or three employees. That's um, an extra year of runtime for some startups. Okay, so I'll tell you the, the uh, the trick real quick. All of these top frameworks, because this app has to talk to, I believe, a Postgres database. So all of them use something called the Postgres Async API. And this is something that I don't think any of the Python projects use. And I think if you just switch to that, you might get a massive boost. All it does is you send, you batch up a lot of your SQL to Postgres using the Async API, and then you asynchronously wait for the responses. It's a huge performance boost. So they're getting 600, 700 requests per second, mostly because they're written in languages like C or Rust and whatnot, but then also because they're using that and they're doing the asynchronous IO. So that's the big secret in case you're wondering. Okay. So now for a lot of people, they don't care about the compute costs, but eventually, if you're especially someone like me, like I could shave my cost for computing down pretty small, but I'm not spending too much. I'm spending like, I think $400, but $400 is $400. I could cut that down to 40 or five, I'm gonna do it. If you're a larger organization and switching to something else could end up saving you like millions a year, then you know that's a serious contender. You have to look at that as a major reason to change languages or to start writing new stuff in languages. Okay, so my conclusions. As I said before, if Python is working, you like Python, don't take this as an us versus them competition. I'm mostly just doing this as a thought experiment, but also as sort of like, check these other things out, right? I do think because of the way Python was managed in the two, three migration, that's a huge risk. They're gonna do it again. I also think Python's the slowest language out there. You saw in the TED benchmarks, I think it's also not changing fast enough to keep up with the times. So for me, I think you really should start looking at alternatives. If you're looking for alternatives that are similar to Python, Nim is your closest cousin. And it has that one major advantage, two major advantage actually, it can hook into anything else. And the second advantage it has is that the Nim compiler is designed so you can alter the compiler. So you can run Nim script to change and add syntax as you need. Now, experienced programmers cringe at this. Uh, the worst thing 
is a new programmer who just figured out metaprogramming. This is the worst. They metaprogram everything until nothing's understandable. If you've ever done old school Lisp code, right? Lisp and Perl, not Perl so much, but the old Ruby, it's very right once. And people are just trying to prove how fancy they are. So keep that in mind. NIM allows you the freedom to alter the compiler, but they also warn you, don't abuse it. Now, if you're looking for something solid, like you were doing web and services and things like that, solid. It's backed by a huge company. The risk it will die is relatively low, except for if Google just decides to kill it at some point. Um, then Go is a solid and tested alternative. Definitely start looking at Go. Um, Rust is probably the least ready of them. But if you're doing embedded, I think Rust is really look worth looking into. Um, and also JavaScript is pretty good on the embedded front too now. Um, there is a quick JavaScript by Fabrice Bellard. Uh, maybe if I can find it for you. Is it QuickJS? Yeah. Amazing. Fabrice Bellard is like the best program in the world. It's unbelievable. It's a very, very tiny, embeddable, uh, fully compliant ES6 implementation. ES2020. Oh, he's upped it. Very interesting. So if you're doing embedded code in C, Definitely check out Rust. Go is Go is is the memory is garbage collected. It's managed. It's difficult to probably do embedded on smaller stuff. Uh, NIM has two memory management systems. One is meant for embedded, so you can control it, and the other one is meant for like non-embedded. But Rust is probably the the best for that. Now, if none of those appeal to you, they're still too scary and new. ES6 is a great middle option. It gives you decent performance. It's definitely not going away. Um, the entire web would have to die for it to go away. It's backed by giant companies, and there's almost anything you ever want already made for you, and it's pretty easy to make new stuff. Um, they've also demonstrated they're not going to throw you under the bus, we say. You know, like, you're like oh, they're not going to basically take advantage of you the way Python did and force you to rewrite code. They are very, they've already demonstrated they migrate people. So those are your options. But again, don't take this to mean Python sucks. It's just that I think Python is old. It's not adapting, and it's not meeting up with the new things that are necessary, type safety, um, faster moving on language features, performance. They're just not there. And I think the best option right now for people is to start looking at alternatives and making sure you know what's out there and try some new stuff. But as usual, if Python's working for you, you got your data science, keep using Python. All right, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. And uh, if you want, we start doing questions. I believe that was an hour, just over an hour. So yeah, I think we can, I can do questions for about 20 minutes, 10, 20 minutes. Uh, what are my thoughts on open source? Um, so I was a very, very big open source developer. And uh, I sort of bought into a lot of that. And um, actually, give me one second. And so um, my thoughts on it have very much changed. I believe if you're doing open source for yourself, right, um, you want to do it as so an artistic expression. Open source is great. Just release it. You don't care about it. But I think... Uh, open source has changed dramatically, and based on like the way Amazon exploits open source developers, and how a lot of the stuff that um, people create gets taken and turned into uh, things that um, make other companies trillions of dollars, and they don't really contribute back. And I just feel like open source now is much more of a a mechanism to extract work, free labor out of people. And I think if you're going to work on a project, someone else's project, do it for the experience. If you're going to make a project, release it with the most restricted license you can. Um, and don't MIT license things, because if it does blow up, it does become popular, you will get zero credit for it. You will not get a job. The industry just changed. I think Amazon, uh, Microsoft, and Google 
uh, dramatically change the industry with open source, where it used to be you did open source and then you could get work and you could get uh, potential con consulting and you could get help and donations. And now they just take it and turn it into a, a trillion dollar web service and you get nothing. Um, but as far as like an art form, an expression, I think open source is great. Just make your stuff and put it out there. And you know what? You don't have to license it. You can put stuff out and you can just say it's copyright because that's how we do um, paintings. Nobody walks into a museum and goes, oh, this, this doesn't have an MIT license, an AGPL license. I'm going to take this painting home, right, or photos. People take photos, they post it online, and if someone uses the photo without permission and without paying for it, that's copyright infringement. So the same applies to code. You can actually just release your code. You don't have to license it. Just say it's copyright, and nobody's allowed to take it, but they can still look at it, just like at a museum. Um, so that's my thought. Uh, yes, yes. Um, so what I do is I actually um, look at those three by myself. So I check out the documentation. I go look at the community. Has there been any major fiascos? Uh, do they have kind of strange bylaws? Um, then I go and see what's available. And the only real way to make sure that it works for you is to sit down and try to make a thing with it. So you got to go through documentation. You got to learn it. You got to see, well, how quickly can I make and pick anything, a blog, a log parser, whatever you're interested in, and try to make it really quick. And then the biggest thing is there's um, a, a website called, I think, Alternatives 2. Um, there's a bunch of websites that will literally tell you, like, if you like uh, Flask from Python, here are 20 alternatives to it. But there's also a language, uh, website that will tell you what other people use. And that website is very informative because a lot of times you'll have a startup that tells you, oh, they use this, and then you find out from... Um, these comparisons, I think it's called Build With. Um, I might look it up while I talk. But they will tell you, oh no, actually Slack uses uh, Kubernetes or something like that. Let me just see if I can find it. Oh yeah, here we go. All right, so let me just pull this up really quick. All right, so this website is called Built With. Dot com and there's a lot of these but I think this one is the best so if I do like um, I think slack.com let's do that and I'm not a robot Great. so it tells you they use Rapleys they use uh, they use Pardot they, they, they do all this stuff and they'll tell you a lot of the tech stack that they use right so if you go and then they claim that like, oh, the language is very popular, that's very popular, and you can't find anyone on this website using it, then that's probably not true. Um, but I'm also just a very big fan of doing an experiment. So go and evaluate it, try to learn it from their documentation, and then try to build the thing with it from their documentation. Um, I would say try to build it using everything you can find. Don't build, write it yourself first, because you want to move quick. And then after you've done that, um, if it worked out for you and you can make it really quick, I would say try to find uh, any horror stories. Like, for example, um, if Uber, they just said that they tried to use Swift and it was a disaster. I went and I looked, and I think if they had just done some basic searches on a few forums, they would have ran it, found these issues. They just didn't look for, like, what's wrong with it. You know, people tend to be less honest about programming languages because um, they want you to join it. But you can find people who would say, you know, hey, oh, with Swift, we weren't able to link more than 12 libraries. That was an issue they had with Swift, which I find insane. Like, you can't link 12 libraries. It's like bread and butter. <laughs> you have to be able to do it. And so I think that's your best bet is just go through those four I did you and then make something. And if when you make something, it works out, and then you go and you look and there's no horror stories, then you're good.
Uh, so I worked at huge organizations. I worked in the U.S. military. I worked for the New York City government. I worked for Bear Stearns. I'm proud to say that, uh, for those of you who don't know, Bear Stearns was the bank in New York that caused the 2008 meltdown. They were not the cause, but they were like the catalyst. That everything just exploded from them. Um, and I worked there on the largest IT project. I don't think my project killed Bear Stearns, but um, whatever. <laughs> it died pretty quick right after that. Um, and the thing you focus on is money. You focus on cost, right? If you're trying to tell people, I just like it. Oh, I like low, I like rust. I like rust. Nah, it doesn't matter. If you can demonstrate that the cost goes down, then that's your biggest win. If you roll in and you say, hey, um, we have this web service, right? I know you do um, probably like uh, embedded devices and they do say some kind of telemetry. And you go, our telemetry service costs us $100,000 a month because we use 20 EC2 instances. If we rewrite it in Dragon or Actix or anything else, we can cut that down to 5,000 a month or 100 a month. That's serious money. Like money is always winning for big businesses. Um, and then once you cut the cost down, just, just expect, especially if it's a company that does budgeting, they'll just use the money for something even more expensive. But I would go with cost every time. Security is always a tough sell. Like nobody really cares about security until they have a problem, right? If you look at the recent um, uh, Solar Winds hack, they actually got hacked because they put the password to their entire system in an open uh, Git repo. So whoever hacked them just looked in the Git repo, saw the password, and logged into their FTP. Right? Nobody cares about security until after they get hacked. So security is not a good sell. Uh, reliability is a real tough sell. So if you want to sell with reliability, you have to have solid metrics. And the only way to do that is A-B test. So you write the new thing, and then you gather metrics on how reliable it is, like how much downtime does it have, how quickly does it respond. And then you have to prove that that's a cost, right? Because big enterprises sort of don't care. Like if it's not reliable, but people are still giving you money, they don't care, right? So for me, cost. I go in and I say, hey, if we wrote this, we rewrote this one service in C++ or NIM or Go or whatever, we could save $100,000 a month. They will go, whoa, make that happen. Do it right away. Um, so never, ever assume a language is here for good. <laughs> the, the history of programming languages is full of dead bodies. Um, and they go away quickly and randomly, it seems. Um, I remember we were using Java 2008 again. And Java made, Sun Microsystems made all its money from banks. And it just took one uh, implosion, 2008 banking collapse. They lost all their money. And now Java's kind of not popular. It took a little bit more, but boom, done. I wouldn't, I couldn't find anyone who's, doing new Java code now. Uh, yeah, I don't know anyone really. Maybe on Android. That's the only place you'd find it. Um, so I would say more, am I going to have to spend money later because they got rid of the language? And what you have to look at is what has been written in it already and how much money is that thing making? So for example, JavaScript. It's never going to go away because trillions and trillions of dollars are made on browsers, right? Go. Google uses Go like crazy. Tons, Kubernetes, all these things. Tons and tons of money is made on Go. So Go is probably not going to go away. Uh, Python? I don't know if Python really makes all that much money compared to, say, Go and JavaScript. Um, data science, like Go, Python data science, yeah, it's, it's pretty much going to be around. But let's say NIM. NIM, uh, you know, like, I don't know how much money they're making, and that's a big indicator of how long you're going to be around. I think it's the number one indicator. Um, unless you find a very solid fan base that is going to keep it going, yeah, it's just going to die. And I think Rust is similar. Like, I thought Rust was going to make it because they're going to rewrite Firefox in it, create the servo engine, and they didn't do it fast enough. Pandemic hits, they lose everything and fire all those people and spin Rust off. 
So again, I'm like, mm, I don't know. I don't know how long Rust is going to be around. But I would definitely say the number one indicator for language longevity is the cash money people make on it. If they aren't making money off of it, yeah, I don't know. Oh, uh, WebAssembly is very interesting because I think it's going to impact not just the web, but a few things about programming uh, that could improve. So the first thing is, yeah, the web, you can make, I think the number one use of WebAssembly now is hacking people's browsers. <laughs> so it's not the greatest implementation, I think. Um, but, you know, you can use any language you want and you can make opaque things, which I think is going to bring more money to the browser frameworks, but could potentially cut out people who want to learn how these things are done. So that's one risk you have with that. But then also, WebAssembly is kind of becoming a good vanilla standard assembly language, almost like an intermediate language. So you have this potential. I, from me, my perspective, I've always wanted to teach assembly language, but I don't want to teach Intel or ARM or any specific CPU. Now I can teach WebAssembly. And I think for education, WebAssembly, especially if it sticks around, could be a huge bonus. Like I could see being able to teach people assembly language in something that's practical, they can see it in their browser. It's straightforward. It's very just cross-platform is a huge win. And then the final thing I really am interested in is there's been some folks who have been saying, you know, this could work as a really good alternative to things like Docker um, or just about anything else. If you can compile to WebAssembly and then translate that on the machines, then you can do a lot of large-scale hosting easier, right, and safer because it runs it. Now, to me, I think that idea um, sounds a lot like what we thought Java would do. So that's, I don't know about that one so much. But the other two, yeah, adding the ability to add more and better capabilities to browsers and make opaque software so people are more willing to sell to the browser or, or just make desktop apps, right? And then also the education capabilities, the ability to teach people WebAssembly as a way to teach them assembly language and not have to worry about CPU differences and weirdness like that. I think those are my two favorite things. Oh yeah, Julia. Um, I believe that's like a stack language. I've seen it. I think it's computation stuff and it's data science stuff looks pretty compelling. And I know it's got a good uh, performance uh, capability. But I think a, with a lot of those languages, they all uh, struggle to find their thing, you know? And again, if it's not backed by a giant company, that can take a while. So when you look at languages like JavaScript and Go, they're backed by massive companies. And so they can, you know, Go can has a thing it's written by google google wants to make web services so go is good at web services you know rust was created by a browser company so you would think rust would be good at making browsers but i guess it's not so with julia i see it's like people look at it it's like wow that's hot you can do some cool stuff with it wow that's fast but again i think the trend in new languages is nothing weird right you saw you go look at rosetta code stack languages are weird you know syntax is kind of weird Julia just look it's just like don't do anything surprising and Julia is kind of like eh, I don't know you know it's it's not compelling and they just don't really have a good story as to like what's its win I sit down and can I sit down and do just some awesome data science graph it up is that its win right um, and I will say in a lot of instances the only thing keeping a language like Julia from exploding is there's nobody who can present it well to beginners Right. I think in a lot of cases, like say my book helped Python quite a lot. Um, so you have uh, Ruby on Rails helped Ruby quite a lot. If you have a uh, Google clearly helping Go quite a lot, like they make awesome things with Go and then everyone's like, oh, look at that. And it gets very popularized. So for me, if I see like the, the presentation and I see someone in like, you know, very little amount of time cranking out something I totally need, like, uh, the blazing fast data science thing, then I would look at Julia. But until then, I haven't really seen much with it.
error messages. Error messages are the number one thing. Um, almost everything else students can overcome. The syntax. So I actually find Python and NIMS indentation syntax is not easy for beginners because when you have bounding that's done by say curly braces or begin end keywords, it's very easy to figure out what the structure is. And constantly I see beginners having problems with indentation as a structure because you know it's spacing. Spacing is kind of hard to judge, right? You know the space level is visually hard to judge. But they get over that. They get over syntax. They get over almost everything. They get over the concept of loops. They get over it. But it's the error messages. The error messages are demoralizing. They don't help. Um, beginners see an error and then they just stop right away, right? And as a professional programmer, even I can't figure out error messages. A lot of times I have to just sort of like hack the code and, and kind of like figure out what's going on and Google. We Google every error message. So I'd say the number one thing that stops all beginners and pros is error messages. And honestly, if I had a choice of what the next movement was, it would be like no terrible error messages. Um, it, they're just awful. Right? And I don't think anyone says they're good. <laughs> they're just bad. Um, yeah, so 2021, I mean, sorry about 2020, it's pretty bad. <laughs> so I, I think, thankfully, we've got the vaccine. So I think you're going to see a lot of travel. If it's anything like past pandemics, where people then suddenly, you know, like um, uh, the, the big flu that wiped out everyone in World War I, right? Remember the swine flu? That created the war, roaring 20s. So right after a major pandemic that people recover from, they're very into entertainment. They're very into new things, travel, um, new experiences. So I would definitely start watching on that. As far as tech trends, um, I think the, you know, Slack, I think uh, selling out and being beat by Microsoft is sort of kind of the proof that that model doesn't work anymore. That, you know, you dump a ton of cash on a popular project and suddenly it becomes a Facebook. I think that's dead. So I think the big thing to look for as far as like trends in business and trends and stuff is uh, a focus on entertainment, a focus on online entertainment. That's been very much established now. Um, it could be that everyone's like, oh, finally, I don't have to do online. But remote work and online experiences and online uh, games and online entertainment, I think, have now been established and people really like it. Um, and also, I think a trend for 2021 is people uh, being much more digital nomad, you know, where they're traveling to countries and using this new online work schedule and the ability to work from home and businesses sort of realizing, hey, I can just shut down this building and save myself 20 million a year. So everyone work from home and then everyone work from home. They're like, you know what? I can, I can go to Sofia. I can go to Barbados. I can go to Bangkok. I don't have to stay in Wyoming. You know, I don't have to say in California, I can live anywhere. Um, so I think a big trend with that is making that easier for large companies, making it easier for people to do online experiences, to work from home, uh, to do uh, everything they have where they work online and they have fun and they travel. Uh, depends on the project. Uh, for my old website that I wrote 10 years ago in like one month, it's Django. Django and Postgres. And uh, yeah, it's pretty terrible. <laughs> I kind of really hate Django. I really hate Django. Um, but it worked. And at the time, it was sort of like the cream of the crop. So I just haven't maintained it. And um, that's about it. And I wouldn't say that's a good stack. Um, my new stuff is all JavaScript. And keep in mind, I'm using all JavaScript just because I'm teaching JavaScript. So I have to add in, I have to make myself use it so I'm competent and I really know what I'm talking about. And I can say, hey, I actually use this. And so the new one is JavaScript and uh, the front end is Svelte, which I showed you, um, svelte.dev. Uh, um, React, Svelte, and Vue, they're all great. Um, I just like Svelte because it's the simplest and I need to teach it to people. So and then it just works. And then on the back end, it's a plain old express, 
you know, I use this thing called Sapper, but it's not very good. And there's nothing fancy about it. It's like a one database, Postgres. Um, a backend is written in Express with plain old JSON APIs. And then the front end is all uh, Svelte and uh, just a plain old browser SPA. And then the only odd thing in my stack is I do have uh, BitTorrent serving up my videos. So I have a couple of services that just do the BitTorrent tracker and uh, just do WebTorrent, well, which is a fantastic project, by the way. If you have to host videos, uh, WebTorrent is awesome. Like it saves you a ton of money, right? Because it, it basically does BitTorrent in the browser and then everyone shares the load. Um, so I think the history of Python and I would say Ruby at the time, like in the early 2000s to 2008, um, I think they were both considered kind of bad languages, like nobody really used them. And you can see the, they were trying to get people from the Java world, Java and C Sharp to come use it, but nobody would bother because Java paid really well, C Sharp paid really well. Um, so I think the only reason that Python became super popular was that you had a Java kind of die off as a server thing. And then you had Ruby and Ruby on Rails take off as a, as a kind of a website. And, you know, a lot of the startups in the 2000 to 2008 era started using it. And so you had that sort of push it. But I think it was kind of, you know, the technology that those that those projects use were really bad. You know, like, honestly, they're very slow. It's not very well implemented, in my opinion. Um, it just doesn't follow a lot of things you would do with a language, right? The, the other languages I mentioned do what you're supposed to do. You know, compilation works and types work and all those things. So I think the only reason it took off was, honestly, a lot of luck. Um, according to people in the project, my book helped some. Um, and then other projects and then just sort of like took off as like it got picked up by universities. But a lot of that happened after, like after Django and Ruby on Rails sort of like became the standard for making a new startup. And there's nothing really about it. I don't think there's anything revolutionary about any successful language. Actually, I would say successful languages have a tiny new feature. Like, you don't see a lot of very successful, popular languages that are radically different, that is super weird. Um, it's always just they had a tiny thing. You know, Java, the tiny thing was garbage collection. That's why we're better than C++, right? C++, the tiny thing was object-oriented programming. That's why we're better than C. And Ruby, the tiny thing was we're dynamic. We have metaprogramming. That's why we're better than Java, right? So I don't think you can really say... Any one thing did it. It was just chance, um, sort of like taking advantage of startups using it, um, a change in education, and sort of a change in the culture and programming. Hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I would say the biggest challenge, obviously, is sales, right? Like getting people to buy your stuff. Um, that's a big one. And uh, in a business like mine, that's really hard because you're at the mercy of Google. Just one day they change their algorithm and you're just in trouble, right? Um, so that's a big deal. I would say I'm very lucky uh, that I just got lucky. I wrote the right thing at the right time um, and it basically got got to be able to be free from working for companies because of that. I would say the biggest mistake I made was, honestly, I got to say, uh, focusing on Python. I think what I should have really done uh, is made sure that I had um, a backup plan because, um, yeah, just once Python 3 became popular, it was clear that they didn't really care about beginners, and that made my work and my life a lot harder. Um, something as simple as the installer, 
like on Windows, the installer doesn't add itself to the path, you know? So now people are told to ins they install Python, they're told to install it from Microsoft, and there's one person working on the installer and he refuses to fix it. So it's things like that. Just Python was too risky an option, and I should have realized that, but I was kind of too busy learning how to paint, <laughs> so I didn't do it. Um, and then the other thing I would say is um, I was trying to be kind, and I made my course free for people to read. And I think that set up a precedent for people to feel it was okay to um, just steal the course and not pay for it. And now I would tell people, if you make something free, make sure that there's a very easy upgrade path to an even better part. Like if you're using the freemium model like I did, make sure there's a way for them to pay it and raise your prices. Because if I had done that, I probably uh, would have had like a, a much higher income rate from that. Oh, and then the last one is I got contacted by Addison Wesley and they asked me to you know, publish the book with them. And that ended up not making me much money and costing me a lot as far as time. And then they started giving people my videos. So I didn't actually make any money off of videos after that. Um, so I had to start making new products and things. So I would say, don't go with the publisher. Whatever you do, publish it yourself. You don't have to contact a publisher. But the only thing the publisher did for me was give me legitimacy, right? Like it, uh, I am a real author, not just some guy who makes books online. You can buy my book on a bookstore. Um, but after that, I should have done one book with them and then nothing else or just not done a book with them at all, right? Oh, my best decision. Um, I would say my best decision is doing it all by myself. Um, a lot of people really don't like that. They want you to like get investment and do a big company and all that, but keeping it small and doing it by myself meant that I didn't spend a lot of time on it. So based on how much I made versus how much effort I put into it, like I, I probably win some award for the laziest amount of money. <laughs> it's like, it was amazing. So by just being smart, being a good programmer and making stuff simple and making it low cost, I was able to uh, extract as much money with the least amount of effort from the project. I would say that's like my biggest, like awesome advice that I could give everyone and the thing I did the best. Okay, great. And uh, really quick, on the bottom right is my Twitter, LZS the hard way. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I only talk code and uh, games and anything about computers on that account. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much.